Okay, so 2021 was another year uh, living through this uh, pandemic. And yeah, th there's been uh, some dramatic impact for the lives of everyone. But there's one thing that the pandemic hasn't stopped, and that's sanctions development. I think you will both agree with me on that. Right. And so let's talk about the, the change in the U.S. administration. There, there were expectations that things will change with the, the new Biden administration. But yet, have you seen some clear signs of changes? Can you talk us through that? Um, yeah, maybe if I can start. I, um, I haven't seen that much change from a content perspective. So there's, thing, there's still a lot of sanctions, designations. Uh, I see a lot of enforcement action. So that hasn't slowed down. I do see a little bit of, yeah, definitely a change in style. Right. Um, under Trump, there were a lot of uh, political designations. So very um, with bombastic press statements, with allegations that I didn't find back in the federal registry. And now it's sort of going it's going back to normal. So more um, straightforward designations, uh, press releases that are just factual. Um, so I see in that sense more a change in style. Um, as opposed to other, like a, yeah, other types of sanctions. And I mean, the, the overall industry was expecting a lot uh, from the new administration as bringing back the U.S. to the multilateral forums and less, as you, as you mentioned, not, not so much of unilateral U.S. sanctions, but more, more cooperation with the U.S. partners and more multilateral sanctions. Is that, is that fair to say that this has changed at least? Or? Yeah, I think we can say that actually. Yeah, yeah, we saw uh, like a, a global trend toward uh, a shift toward a uh, more un multilateral approach of, of sanctions. Uh, like for example, we have now the new, new negotiation of um, the, the new GCPOA, uh, which is ongoing and uh, which started uh, since uh, last June. And this is a maybe a, a good um, a good element uh, for 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 more multilateral sanctions. We also have seen the, the new uh, OFAC sanctions review, which has been published uh, last October. And one of the main uh, elements uh, is, um, in order to, to, to modernize sanctions, was to uh, really have a coordinated approach of sanctions uh, be between the US and its allies. And uh, I think uh, this is uh, going to be the trends for the next uh, couple of years. Yeah, that, that, I think that's really interesting. And to some extent, you could argue that maybe the US has uh, felt the limit to unilateral sanctions. And I mean, we have seen uh, reactions from, your, from other countries, from the EU and other parts of the world that are basically foreign countries are uh, developing their own uh, policy tools to counter the effects of those uh, US unilateral sanctions. And I think, yeah, you, you know very well the, the changes ongoing in the EU, EU blocking statute. Can you maybe talk a little bit more about what's going on the on the EU side? Yeah, yeah. So um, on the EU side, and it's not the only one. Uh, we saw a, a lot of blocking statutes uh, adopted by Russia, Venezuela, China, uh, even Canada in the 80s. But now uh, for, for 2021, I think the, the focus was on the EU blocking statutes because it's uh, uh, currently being amend amended. Um, and we already had two uh, feedback period opened by the Commission. Uh, with uh, more than 86 contributions from uh, for the last uh, feedback period, which just just closed, uh, and really interesting feedback uh, from the uh, sector, from the private sectors, uh, and from uh, other EU member states. Uh, so we are now expecting the, the the publication of the draft amended version of the EU blocking statutes, and hopefully this will provide more guidance for EU operators uh, in order to really understand what it's expecting from them, uh, because. As of today, they are kind of, uh, you know, like stuck between uh, the, the, the rock and the hard place. And uh, they, they really don't know how to react uh, regarding this conflicting of laws between the US and the EU. Same for the China, for the Chinese uh, countermeasures that, uh, that uh, we've seen uh, developing the, this year. That's really interesting. And worth noting that the EU blocking statute is actually a pretty old uh, legal instrument and that's being brought at the core of the, the EU responses to those, uh, those uh, US sanctions. And I think, I mean, the, the, the key, I mean, the bottom line is that the, the, um, the US sanctions on Iran have had devastating impacts, uh, economic impacts on EU operators. I, I recently read a report, it was about 90 billions in direct losses for EU operators. And, but then I, I really want to talk about those adverse impacts of, of sanctions. So th there are obviously economic impacts uh, as to what you cannot do as part of the sanctions, but there are obviously other adverse impacts, mm. some that we have heard about as part of the pandemic, uh, can, can the humanitarian side effects yeah. to sanctions. I mean, it's... Yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, sanctions have a huge impact sometimes on people that, you know, really don't deserve it. You know, look at Afghanistan when the U.S. troops um, withdrew this summer. 
you see a lot of um, humanitarian NGOs, right, non-governmental organizations that are helping the local population, uh, you know, getting to basic foods and, and things like that. They have no means of paying their staff. Uh, there's, you know, suddenly there are questions being raised like, okay, now the Taliban is uh, in charge, so the Ministry of Education that we used to fund with books or school uh, funds for school, can we still do that, right? And there are licenses being issued, but what you see is in, in, in practice, uh, even though there are licenses and even though the, um, you know, the government, it's, it's still, yeah, it's still a gray zone for many banks mm. uh, just because of the risk. And if you, um, because banks will be, you know, considering, okay, the, is it worth all the effort? You know, what do we have to, we have to explain this to our examiners that we're doing transactions to Afghanistan. Um, so sometimes there's a disconnect between the law and the like reality. And the, the, how it works in practice. Because yeah. Yeah, that's something that I heur I've heard from many uh, criticism of US sanctions, that even though theoretically, say, uh, medical assistance to Iran, for example, there are theor theoretical license <laughs> available there, but since the, the financial flows are heavily sanctioned, but at the end of the day, you cannot uh, run those operations because they cannot be the financial flows uh, on the other side of the <laughs> of the deal, right? So yeah. that's really, and I think, I mean, that that's really relates back to what you mentioned about the, the recent uh, US sanctions policy review. N it's really about the effectiveness of sanctions because regulators don't want to, to cripple ordinary citizens. So th there is this uh, ongoing reflection as to how to make sanctions more effective. Is it something that you felt um, um, apparent in the recent uh, US sanctions policy review? Um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely some pointers, right, in that review, and one of them is to uh, mitigate the effect of uh, sanctions on humanitarian efforts. Uh, but there's also s some sanctions are too broad, and they want to make sure that they are tied to a specific policy uh, objective. So, for instance, to protect a particular population, like minority population, instead of going after, you know, a whole country. So, I think in that sense, there's, you know, some some ways that they can modernize the um, yeah the the approach to sanctions and also from a practical perspective in terms of resources in in OFAC right um, mm. the agency that that deals with this uh, there's a lot of there's been guidance uh, on new sectors new constituencies but there needs to be a lot more outreach and communication to bring them on board I think and that is also one of the things that they want to improve to uh, make sure that people are aware of of these sanctions and what they can do to comply. I think you touched upon a very important point on the, the actual policy objectives that are pursued through sanctions and what we, when we look at the trends as to what sanctions programs are being implemented, which ones trigger the most updates, we, we see a change. I mean, th there are still quite, quite a good amount of uh, country-based sanctions and for 2021 we have seen a heavy, uh, heavy set of sanctions designations in relation to countries such as Myanmar or Belarus, etc. But there is another trend which is towards more thematic sanctions and that's something that has emerged with uh, terror terrorism sanctions, uh, other areas such as WMD proliferation, but a more recent trend and interest an interesting one are uh, sanctions in relation to human rights abuses and corruption. And that's something that we see as a really strong emerging trend. W would you agree with me on that? Or? Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, the, the thematic sanctions or sometimes I call them, I think, horizontal sanctions that are sort of cross, they cross borders, mm -hmm. right? So Global they and, target yeah. a, not a they target a particular threat, not a particular country. So, and the threat can be in any country. So, for instance, human rights. And it is, yeah, definitely something that we've seen a lot the, this year. Uh, it's not a new thing, I think, because, I mean, look at, you know, the, the sanctions that came out, you know, after September 11. It was very thematic, right? Terrorism financing. Um, and you see now, but you see some more themes like human rights, uh, but also like cyber, right? Cyber, cyber right. sanctions or even like very targeted things like drilling in the Mediterranean. <laughs> so um, yeah, so there's more and more of these thematic uh, sanctions that are very useful, I think, because you can target, um, for instance, in terms of human rights, you can target corrupt government officials in any country, right? You don't have to have a geographic regime to be able to target uh, corruption. And that's exactly the same logic for the human rights uh, mm -hmm. sanctions. And in the EU, we saw, uh, we've seen uh, last year, um, the adoption of a new uh, global human rights sanctions program in December of 2020, uh, which has been now uh, used several times uh, target for to, in order to target uh, Russia, uh, 
uh, to target China, th South Sudan, uh, Myanmar. So that's uh, really, uh, I think, a new tool to, to look at, um, and which is really showing how the, the sanctions are now uh, going to t maybe trick that target a more uh, malignant behavior mm -hmm. than uh, on, on also only a country or, or an individual or an entity. It's, it's easily understood that it's uh, interesting for a country to have a flexible tool that can be used to target someone in any country, basically, where the threat is actually uh, occurring, right? If, if the regulators had to implement a specific program for each country, that would be yeah. a lengthy process. Yeah, like I think it was mid, next, mid, mid of this year, there were like 70 um, corrupt uh, oligarchs in Bulgaria, I think it was. They were targeted by OFAC. You know, there was no program against Bulgaria, right? But you could exactly. target like a big group of people who were doing, you know, stealing all this money or, or taking bribes. Um, so in that sense, it's it's very uh, uh, it's very efficient. Yeah. I noticed that designation, and I think that there is an immediate uh, complaints implication is that you don't uh, know where the bad guys are necessarily, and yeah. potentially those uh, those sanctions target can be basically next door, across the street, right? In, even in the EU, you have actually, it was, I think, the, the largest set of designations by OFAC mm -hmm. this year, a network of Bulgarian uh, entities and yeah. individuals. Well, basically EU entities and, and individuals. So yeah, that's an interesting uh, yeah. development. Yeah. yeah, and I think in terms of compliance also, suddenly adverse media becomes more and more important because if you want to sort of look ahead of what's coming, you may want to look at adverse media screening uh, hits because, you know, what is, you know, people with a bad reputation of being involved in human rights abuses or corruption, tomorrow they may be on the sanctions list. Absolutely. So uh, that will be a good thing to, to take a closer look at, I think. I think that one of the main takeaways from, from this is, for, from, from a compliance perspective, would be to really uh, uh, moving uh, for, uh, away from the uh, geographical approach uh, of, of sanctions and really trying to implement a thematic approach in, in the compliance program for, for companies. And one of those uh, expanding thematic to look at is definitely corruption, because I think the EU is about to introduce its very own uh, corruption sanctions program following the UK, which, mm. which did store uh, this year, and uh, the US already has one. But so, okay, yeah. uh, if we play the, the prediction game uh, for, yeah. for a second, I, I, if we uh, were to anticipate um, emerging concerns in international security or possible uh, areas that could be hit by sanctions. Yeah. Would you would you make any would you dare make any? It's any hard to have this crystal ball, right, to figure <laughs> out know, what's I happening know. next. Uh, but I think just by looking at some of the um, uh, priorities, like if I look at the U.S., um, corruption is definitely something that you know fight against corruption is very important for the Biden administration. They um, made it a national security interest uh, around June or July of this year. And I think more, there will be more interagency cooperation with regards to targeting corruption. There will be uh, probably more sanctions, more enforcement actions um, on that particular topic. So it makes sense for companies to really look at their compliance programs and make sure something like not only drug trafficking and terrorism and um, fraud is being um, being covered, but also corruption. It's very, it's a very specific theme. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense for companies to to really look at their programs from that perspective and make sure that is covered. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm. Okay, I have to have a wild guess to make with you, and yeah, you, what you, do you, you can, you can, yeah. can share <laughs> <laughs> You can react to that. I mean, I'm witnessing obviously uh, increasing concern around ESG, you know, environmental, social, and governance topics. And so part of that is uh, env environmental concerns. And so I would not be surprised if in the coming five to 10 years, we were to observe new sanctions being imposed in relation to environmental crime. That's something that has been in the works at the UN level to, uh, to recognize ecocide as a criminal, uh, as an international crime. So I think we could maybe foresee uh, developments on the sanctions, uh, sanctions area. What do you think? Maybe. I, I <laughs> no, definitely. I, I think, think that could be good possible. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Great thought. I. Um, Maybe not right now. Not in 2022. Yeah. I said five to ten but years. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, Let's yeah, be yeah. safe. Here. <laughs> One guess. But uh, no, no. I think yeah, that that could definitely happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And there's definitely more emphasis on the ESG, uh, your compliance infrastructure in in many, especially some of the larger banks. I see it also. So it, yeah, I think it's a good uh, prediction. Yeah. But we have important tests coming up in Germany uh, next year with a mandatory due diligence on the, on the supply chain. Uh, an initiative is underway in the EU. So yeah, I really think there is, a, there is an area uh, of development for the, for the future. Mm -hmm.